Welcome to this session. My name is Mark Krusen. I'm going to be your host. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Alexander Moreira Almeida, who will present Methodological Exclusion of the Transcendent, Implications for Theory and Practice, discussing the implications, obstacles, and guidelines for the methodological exclusion of the transcendent as proposed by Theodore Flournoy. Dr. Moreira Almeida is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Research Center in Spirituality and Health, NUPES, at the Universidad Federal de Juiz de Fora in Brazil. He's also Chair of the Section on Spirituality of the Latin American Psychiatric Association. Without further ado, I will clear the stage for our speaker. Hello. Many thanks for the opportunity for being here. I'd like to congratulate Everton Maraldi, Annalisa Ventura, Ventura and the, the Parapsychological Association for this wonderful symposium and, for the, and thanks for the opportunity for being here and for you to watch us. So we'll discuss here about the idea of methodological exclusion of transcendent. If it is really needed for research in psychology of religion and in parapsychology and what to, could we do about, the, about this? Okay, so uh, specifically, uh, there has been in the last three or four decades a huge increase in academic studies in religion and spirituality. We have nowadays literally thousands of studies published in mainstream journals. And it has been widely recognized that spiritual experiences are a major source for religious and spiritual beliefs and practices. Most of the studies that we have in the study of religion and spirituality usually focus more on beliefs, but also focus on the impact on health of these practices and of these beliefs. But the, specifically the study of the spiritual experiences, uh, these studies have been neglected during most of the 20th century, and, but there has been a renewed academic interest investigating the spiritual experience, specifically or especially the phenomenology of these experiences, the precipitants, and even the impact of these experiences on peoples who have these experiences. However, there is always the question, specifically in the study of scientific studies of, of spirituality or in psychology of religion, is it possible to investigate the ultimate nature of spiritual experiences, to investigate the ontology of these experiences? In this sense, how far a scientific exploration can go investigating spiritual experiences? Of course, we need to investigate the biological, the psychological, and the social factors that influence, that shape, or even may generate spiritual experiences. But the major question is, should we restrict ourselves only to these factors? Or would it be acceptable to include the spiritual or the transcendent as an additional explanatory factor? It often has been assumed or taken for granted in mainstream science that we should not include the spiritual transcendental aspect in the explanatory um, tools for spiritual experiences. Sometimes, or quite often, there has been an idea that we should focus only on biological, psychological, and social factors that would explain everything with nothing uh, extra beyond that. And one of the most famous positions in this sense is the methodological exclusion of the transcendent proposed by the Swiss psychologist Theodore Flournoy. Uh, so the main outline of our talk here is present what is methodological exclusion of transcendent as proposed by Flournoy, what it is, and the reasons that he provides to it. And then we will discuss the problems with methodological exclusion of the transcendent. Sociological problems, epistemological problems, methodological problems. And also we'll discuss the implications for research and theory and why we should reject methodological exclusion of transcendent and we should include 
the transcendent in the scientific exploration of, exp of spiritual experience. And finally, we'll discuss some briefly some research guidelines. So uh, the mythological exclusion of transcendent was proposed by Flor Noir in a very famous paper in 1902. And he, he said that any somewhat acute exp religious experience in those who experience it has an order of higher religious realities, the certainty of the existence of God or of gods, of or of other spiritual beings. So here he shows, he acknowledges how the spiritual experience are important in generating the beliefs in spiritual realities that are in the core of spirituality. However, he claims that the question of the nature of the objective realities in which the religious people believes holds no place whatsoever in the work of religious psychology. And then he calls it the principle of the exclusion of the transcendence. So religious psychology does not reject more than it does not affirm the transcendent. It limits to ignore them. And he claims that is the very condition of the existence of religious psychology as positive science. But as we will see next slide in Flor Noir's own text, the point is not he just not uh, be, remains agnostic for the spiritual reality or the transcendental reality. Actually, he thinks that we should, we must explain everything by biological uh, material aspects. So it is. Religious psychology is inspired by the following two general principles. First, exclusion of the transcendence a negative and defense principle. Psychology abstains from any verdict on the objective scope of this phenomenon. So psychology cannot say anything about the objective reality of, for example, of an out-of-body experience or in a visionary experience, an end-of-life experience, deathbed vision, whatever. The second, I think this is the more problematic aspect the biological interpretation of religious phenomena. Uh, in this uh, phenomenon, uh, they consider the phenomenon as a manifestation of a vital process to determine the psychophysiological nature of this experience. So that's the point. I think the, the major problem is that we, he claims that we must restrain ourselves to biological interpretation of religious phenomena Determine, seeking to determine the psychophysiological nature of this experience. Okay, so this is basically the claim, but it's quite surprising that in, in this uh, paper, this very prominent, important paper, when he proposed the mythological speech of transcendent, he provides actually uh, uh, not a strong reason, not strong reasons for that. So basically, the only reason that he provides in that paper is the painful conflicts of theological and metaphysical opinions, the blur of ink and blood rushed over the battlefields of philosophy and the wars of religion, which resulted from this fatal coefficient of transcendent reality by the fact that man has the mania to want to impose recognition on his peers without worrying whether they have also experienced it. So his idea is that, well, discussing the transcendental reality has raised, has generated the religious wars and other problems. So we should avoid discuss this because it can generate conflicts. This is basically, actually, basically the main, uh, almost the only reason that he provided in that paper for this. Well, now we will start to question this perspectives. The first is the sociological aspect. So the misuse of the transcendence is a reason to, re to, for to, have to forbid uh, the use of transcendent in scientific discussion. The problem is that the misuse of ideas is universal. Because if we would forbid, discuss any idea that was misused, we cannot talk about anything. 
The idea of freedom, of progress, fraternity, equality, all these ideas gave reason for many wars, for many oppression, for many problems. The problem, the, or the point is, how can we handle in a um, reasonable way these discussions and these divergences? Even in science, as we know, the Darwinian natural selection was misused to support eugenics, social Darwinism. And of course, it, is, it does not require for us to uh, avoid discuss about Darwinian natural selection, for example. And even the Mendelian genetics in agriculture in the Soviet Union, uh, there was many scientists were persecuted and even killed because of scientific dispute, uh, disputes regarding genetics in improvement in agriculture. So I think the major lesson that we can have for all these uh, wars and conflicts is intellectual humility and tolerance. It's not just suppress the discussion of a specific topic. Now, regarding more, regard more the metaphysics, uh, science does not imply or require physicalism. It's false that science would imply that we should or we must only find the biological, psycho, bio, biopsychological explanations for anything. Many authors and uh, uh, propose a kind of expanded naturalism that we could have the material aspects of the universe and we could have consciousness. And consciousness could be another irreducible aspect of the universe, a transcendent aspect, transcendent the meaning, meaning that is something beyond the physical particles and matter and things like that, physical forces. So uh, this idea is uh, an, another a possible possibility uh, for discussing the reality and, and how can we explain, for example, human behavior. And this idea that uh, naturalism does not necessarily mean materialism, that we could be expanded naturalism, like uh, Frederick Myers, William James, and more recently, Thomas Nagel have proposed. Alistair Hard, one of the most important researchers on spiritual experiences at Oxford in 19th century, uh, he defended that this divine element is part of the natural process, not supernatural, but paraphysical. So there will be a paraphysical, a transcendental aspect in nature that's not material. So, and he, when he was trying exactly to explain the spiritual experience. So this is something that we would endorse also. And also this, because this idea that is science has proved naturalism or physicalism, or that science implies in physicalism, it's unfortunately too often stated in many mainstream journals. For, for example, here we performed a systematic review of the best psychiatric journals in the last 20 years. And we found that uh, many high-cited papers talked about uh, physicalism and materialism as a scientific fact, as that science has been proved that that anything beyond that would be ir irrational superstitions and things like that. However, this is not actually the state of art. There are a lot of misguided assumptions and uh, misreporting of uh, empirical data. So we need to be very careful about not taking for granted physicalism as a scientific idea or a, a, effect of nature. Of course, this is a hypothesis, but it's not uh, something that has been proved philosophically or scientifically. So the game is open to other possibilities. So that's the point. Regarding the ultimate nature of consciousness and spiritual experiences, we are, in a sense of Thomas Kuhn, we are in a pre-paradigmatic scientific field. We don't have actually a good scientific paradigm well accepted by the whole community that would explain well 
this subject of investigation, consciousness or spiritual experiences. So exactly because of that, we must be open to radically different paradigm candidates. We need no, we don't need any a priori ontological commitment to physicalism, to spiritualism, to idealism, to whatever. But we must be open to all these possibilities. There is no reason, no reasonable reason, so, so why we should avoid, okay, we can discuss uh, spirit experience, but only, we must only think dogmatically in that kind of explanations. It's not a good scientific way to pursue a new field. So, and then in another point, we must have a precedence of empirical findings over our theories. Because if you restrict the, the, the empirical investigation and exclude everything that does not fit our theory, of course, it would impair the scientific development. For example, William James uh, said in his famous variety of religious experience that medical materialism seems indeed a good appellation to, for the, to the true simple-minded system of thought. Finishes up St. Paul by calling his vision a discharging legion of the occipital cortex. So that's the point. He's criticized exactly this. The need to explain religious experience only by biological, psychological aspects. This is exactly what James is complaining about. And he goes further. The excess of religious experiences, the thing, the thing, by which we finally must judge them must be that element or quality in them which can which we can meet nowhere else that's the point that's the transcendent the transcendent something else there is something else in this experience that are crucial to this so uh the Pro the problem with the methodological exclusion of the transcendent is that it requires an a priori, it excludes any a priori ontological reality to what is experienced by those who report spiritual experience. Okay, it's it said by Flanois that he is agnostic about the ultimate nature, okay, but we must find all, we must reduce the phenomenon, the spiritual experiences to psychophysiological explanations. So it, he says that he's agnostic, but his approach claims for a physicalist approach, psychophysiological explanation. That is the problem, the risk of the nothing buttery. It's nothing but uh, neurons, it's nothing but uh, uh, wishful thinking, it's nothing but psychological distortions and things like that. And a major problem with this approach, exclusion of the transcendent, is how can how would we deal with reports, for example, of alleged alleged veridical perceptions during out of body near death experience? Okay, so someone is report during a near death experience, the brain, for example, in a cardiac arrest, the brain is not functional. There is no electrical activity. The brain is not functioning. But the person, when the person is resuscitated, the person claims to have seen several things to be from the from above, from the ceiling, seeing things that describe precisely things that actually happened. Okay, why should we avoid it, forbid it, to to consider the possibility of the transcendental reality in the sense that consciousness is something beyond the psychophysiological aspect? Then can have actual ontological existence or for example also why should we explain this experience only by hypoxia about uh, wishful thinking about problems in memory and things like that so the apparitions of a dying person to a distant friend who, who was not aware of his her death is the same so we must Attribute it to, to coincidence, to hallucination, to, to, to brain discharge, to epilepsy, but we could not uh, add this transcendental aspect of the experience. Of course, we need to take into consideration the biological, psychological, and social, but why should we be forbidding a priori 
to consider this other possibility. It's not, it does not seem reasonable. So the exclusion, the logical exclusion of transcendent would lead to a dogmatic and authoritarian a priori denial, denial of even take a look at any possible empirical evidence supporting the transcendent paraphysical aspect of nature. Because if you are al not allowed to do this, we need to reject upfront these ideas. But actually, it has already happened. That's the point. For example, the, the very good uh, systematic review performed by Edsel Cardenian and published at American Psychologist a few years ago about the experimental evidence for parapsychological, parapsychological phenomena. And he claims that in the end of his review, that the evidence provides support for the reality of Psi. Okay? And the evidence for this reality is comparable to other phenomena in psychology. So he, he, he discussed a lot of studies, a lot of meta analysis a lot of reviews, a lot of studies showing that. Okay. So, but what is, what is most impressive is the, the, the uh, response paper to his, to his paper. This paper discussing and questioning the Cardenas paper it says, this, it says basically the following. The claims made by parapsychologists cannot be true. They can have no ontological status. So the data have no existential value. So that's the point. They, they start from the assumption that it cannot exist and it cannot be taken in consideration in research. That's something similar for that previous idea that we cannot accept any spiritual experience that could not be explained by psychophysiological explanations. So they claim the pigs cannot fly and the data that suggests that they can are necessarily flawed. So that's the point. The point. Uh, so I'm here in this sense, I'm um, um, restricted by my theoretical assumption ignoring or disregarding empirical evidence. Since we are in a pre-paradigmatic phase, we must do the opposite way. We need, of course, we can have hypotheses, we can have theories, we must have them, but we must know in a humble scientific approach that they are provisional uh, hypotheses, provisional paradigm candidates. And then we must be open to all sorts of empirical evidence and to be also open to all sorts of theoretical models that could explain this phenomenon. Of course, these theoretical models could be physicalist models, could be transcendental models, whatever. And, and another very interesting aspect also is that perhaps even Flournoy did not follow exactly his recommendation of methodological exclusion of the transcendent. He did not uh, disregard upfront all, all, all scientific proposals that considered spirituality or the transcendental aspect of the universe or of human beings or of spiritual experience. For example, Flournoy had a long life friendship and also positive appraisals of William James and Meyer's work at both clearly reject methodological exclusion of transcendent, as the previous presentation from Everton and also from Half Hood. And it's also interesting that the book review that Flournoy wrote for the last Meyer's work, Human, uh, the personal, human Immortality, and the, the, uh, human immortality. Uh, this, uh, the Flournoy uh, review says, Myers posthumous work, and in this work uh, uh, of Myers, Myers clearly does not follow the theological exclusion of transcendent. Myers clearly considered the transcendent aspect of reality, and Myers recognized that and praised uh, Myers for that. So Myers posthumous work forms so vast and so a rich monument. Myers' immediate goal is to set up a new science devoted to the experimental proof of the existence and the survival of the soul. And he goes further. 
there is something stimulating and whole and wholesome in seeing a spiritualist system grow. Myers' spiritualism does not seem to me to require immediate rejection. That if ever illusion is vanquished and truth discovered in the mysterious domain of occult phenomena, it will be done only by following the path Myers has cleared so thoroughly. By what I mean, delve ever more deeply into the investigation of which he has been the leading light. So it seems here very clear that um, Sorma himself is open to these different possibilities. So it's important, it, it, it makes us to think about people who would reject upfront any ideas that uh, does not follow the methodological exclusion of the transcendent. There are some other discussions on this. For example, the Oxford Handbook of Psychology and Spirituality by Lisa Miller from Columbia University. He discusses exactly that. The, 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 great the greatest contribution for scientific psychology, for, for spiritual psychology to psychology is the examination of psychology's core ontological assumptions. Perhaps our greatest opportunity for a contribution to the field. For example, to understand spirituality as ontological real. So there are people in the field of psychology of religion open to the re to ontological reality of the transcendent and the implication of it for our understanding of spiritual experiences. James himself has a very interesting saying here. I feel like a man who must set his back against an open door quickly if he does not wish to see it closed and locked. I believe that a candid consideration of PCMA super, uh, supernaturalism and a complete discussion of all its metaphysical bearings is to be the hypothesis. So uh, that's the point. Uh, uh, he's exactly avoiding to close the door to discuss this supernaturalism, the transcendental aspect, and things like that. So and uh, including the transcendent in academic research and theory on spirit experience would be what Half Hood has said, a methodological agnosticism, not materialism. Because actually, if we reject upfront transcendental aspects, it will be not agnosticism. It will be a commitment to, mat to materialistic, a, phys a physicalist explanation. So we must have a theoretical and methodological agnosticism. We can be open to different perspectives, of course, but submitting them to a most rigorous analysis. So the methodological and theoretical pluralism, that's the point. We must have a Darwinian competition of paradigm candidates. Of course, if you can, if you'd like to explain Alleged veridical, uh, uh, alleged, alleged veridical perception in near-death experience, of course you can propose a physiological explanation, you can propose a psychological explanation, but also should be allowed to discuss the possibility of a, of a consciousness beyond the body. And all these kind of paradigm candidates should, should show their strengths and weaknesses in a Darwinian competition. So we need to take in consideration all the empirical data available and not just re, uh, select the, the ones that fits our own idea. For example, as Charles Start proposed four decades ago, basic rules of scientific method to integrate this, this altered state of consciousness in even the possibility of this transcendental aspect. We need to have good observation. We need to have a, a theory that has observable consequences. But we don't need to have physicalist restrictions, not necessarily. Of course, physicalist hypotheses are welcome, but they cannot be the only game in town. Several other authors have proposed that. Edson Cardenia has proposed a call for open aspect, an open study of all aspects of consciousness. There is also the proposal of post-materialist science that is not committed specifically to the physicalist point. So that's basically the idea. And, and as we know, there are, this is a systematic review of papers of empirical studies discussing uh, the spiritual experience that suggests some transcendental aspect of uh, spiritual experiences and of human beings. We have more than 
2,000, oh, I'm sorry, it's in Portuguese here, More, almost 2,000 papers. And the impact factor of this paper is similar to other research areas, okay? So, and this is some examples, some books like The Reducible Mind from Edward Kelly, Emil Kelly, this Exploring Frontiers of Mind Brain Relationship. It's exactly books that try to put together and to propose a non-physicalist explanation for spiritual experience, but using scientific rules, okay? And, uh, okay, I think, so I will finish with this quote from William James that uh, um, when was not the science of the future steered to its conquering activities by the little rebellious exceptions to the science of the present. And he said, hardly as yet has the surface of the effects called psychic begun to be scratched for a scientific purpose. It's through following these facts, I'm persuaded that the greatest scientific conquests of the coming generation will be achieved. So that's the, his call for us. So I'd like to thank you. And here are my contacts. Someone would like to contact me. Thank you very much. And I will open the floor now for questions.